Okay, good evening for those who are coming in. Tonight, our topic is emotional intelligence, how to minimize relational regrets. I hope everyone had a happy holiday, a Merry Christmas, and uh, we're trying to do a different setup here. I know there's a lot of things that I say, and then a visual might be helpful. But again, right now, take the opportunity to grab paper and pen and all that stuff so that we make sure that we have everything necessary here. Hold on real quick. Are you talking about me? Hold on real quick. Okay, we are back. Where am I? There you go, shirt change, I was hot. Okay, here we go. So look, emotional intelligence, how to minimize relational regrets is tonight's topic. So grab your papers, grab your pens, because I wanna make sure you have everything you need to succeed in your relationships. Now, when I talk relationship, I'm talking the relationship with yourself, the relationship with those that you work with, and the relationship between you and your family, okay? And the reason why emotional intelligence is so incredibly important, there's a fascinating book by a man named Dr. Daniel Goleman, and if you have the chance or the opportunity to read it, grab yourself a copy. And besides this book, he wrote several articles. One of my favorite, it's called um, What Makes What Makes a Leader? What Makes a uh, Yeah, What Makes a Leader? And in this article, he writes this. I have found that the most effective leaders are alike in one crucial area, right? He's talking about leadership, and he's specifically in this article talking about leaders in the workplace. However, this idea of leadership can be seen not only in the workplace, but also in our homes and in our communities, okay? And so he says this, they all have a degree of what has come to be known as emotional intelligence. And he says, it's not that IQ and technical skills aren't relevant or that they're not important. They are relevant and they are important. He says, but mainly as threshold capabilities, meaning when you are in a business, you are there whether you did your bachelor's or your master's, you have some idea of what's going on, right? You have some skills and some talents that were necessary for you to get into the business. However, once you are there, he says, what is the difference between people as they start climbing up the tier in their jobs is emotional intelligence. He says that these threshold capabilities are entry level requirements for these positions. But as you start to climb the ladder, whether it's in your professional life, whether it's in your health, and yes, even in your relationships, your romantic relationships and your familiar relationships, emotional intelligence is going to make all the difference from what? You minimizing relational regrets, okay? Welcome, welcome those who are coming in. And so this is the link that Dr. Goldman found, a direct link between emotional intelligence and the results of your life. And so look, what we're gonna try to do, and Renee's gonna have an interesting job of bringing me back and forth here on Instagram so that you guys can see. Here, we try to do two things. We want to dominate what we call the triangle of death, and hopefully you can see me there, let me see. The triangle of death would be this. If you've been with us for a long time, you should know this pretty well by now, which is this, look. Fear, stress, and anxiety. Okay, we want to dominate fear, stress, and anxiety so that we can balance the triangle of life, which is quality relationships, health, 
and your dreams, your goals, the desires and the passions that God has given you, okay? So this is a triangle of death and we want to balance the triangle of life. I'm going to write R for relationships, H for health, and we're gonna put V for vocation or your passion. Okay, hopefully Renee can get that. So this is the idea and my argument and Dr. Goldman's argument is that emotional intelligence can help us know, manage and understand our emotions so that way we can operate, balance and live well in the triangle of life, okay? So the first one, Dr. Goldman, he defines emotional intelligence in five spheres and this is what we're going to be doing in our time together. So. I'm gonna delete this part right now, okay? So if you have your paper and pen, write it down. This is a triangle of death and then triangle of life, okay? So now we're gonna go to what makes emotional intelligence. So if you put emotional intelligence and make a circle, the first one is going to be self-awareness. Am I good there? Okay, self-awareness, what does this mean? Right, it's the old to know thyself. Self-awareness means that you have a deep understanding of your emotions, meaning your strengths, your weaknesses, your needs, and your drives. I always say here that you and I, we need to start thinking about our thinking. Why? Because our thoughts matter. Why do our thoughts matter? Because thoughts lead to actions, Actions become habits. Habits form our character or our identity and our character and identity, they produce the results or the destiny of our lives. Today, right now, you are living results that you have chosen and planted last week, last month, or last year. That's why this idea of being self-aware is knowing your thoughts, your strengths, your weaknesses, your needs, and your drives. Those who are self-aware, Again, for those who are just joining us now, we are talking about emotional intelligence and how with emotional intelligence, we can minimize relational regret. We can dominate stress, fear, and anxiety so that we can live well in the triangle of life, which is relational, quality relationships, health, and our vocation. And so the first part here of emotional intelligence is self-awareness. I need to know myself. I need to start thinking about my thinking. People who are self-aware are those who they're not overly critical about others, but they're not unrealistically hopeful. They have what? Balance, that's the key word. They have balance and they have consistency. They understand that because I have strengths and weaknesses, I also know that others have strengths and weaknesses. And what am I going to do? Because I am aware of my strengths, I'm going to find people who have strengths that I don't have so that we can complement each other. People who are self-aware are honest with themselves, and by being honest with ourselves, we can then be honest to other. We are able to recognize how, what I'm feeling, how it affects others, how it affects my health, how it affects my job performance, and how it affects my relationships. And finally, people who are self-aware, and to me, this is one of the most important things, they have an understanding of their values and their goals. People who are self-aware, they have a strong sense of identity, a strong sense of character. They know where they're headed, why they're headed, and they know exactly what they need to do to get there. Let me give you an example of what self-awareness looks like. A professional who is self-aware would be willing and able to turn down a job offer that has tempting financial value because it does not fit with their principles and their long-term goals. Do you see how, how interesting that is? The same is also true. Someone who is self-aware about their health goals is able to turn down, let's say, that dessert because in that moment, that dessert does not fit with their goals or their principles for their health. Someone who is self-aware relationally will be able to turn down when they're getting hit on, right? Because it does not fit their principles and their long-time goals to remain married. Are you starting to understand why self-awareness is a critical component of emotional intelligence and how it minimizes relational regret? 
On the flip side, a person who lacks self-awareness makes decisions that brings them inner turmoil. Why? Because they begin to tread upon buried values. What are your principles? What are the values of your life? You need to be self-aware. You need to know what these are. So that way, when you are making decisions, they are in line with those values. So why? So you will minimize relational regret. Start, is that making sense? Welcome, welcome those who are coming in. We are here talking emotional intelligence and how to minimize relational regret. In the first part, it's a five part, um, component to emotional intelligence is being self-aware. Well, how do I recognize self-awareness? How do I know if I'm self-aware? How do I know if someone else, you know, my family, my friends, my coworkers are self-aware? Well, the person who is self-aware, they show an openness and an ability to be realistic. They speak accurately. They speak openly about their emotions about their impact. They're not, they're not embarrassed of emotions. They don't shy away from emotions. And to me, something critical is that they know their triggers, right? As a husband the other day who looked at his wife and said, honey, the reason I'm feeling insecure is because right now you are making more money than I am. And it's making me feel insecure because no longer am I the breadwinner of the family. This is a man who is self-aware. He knows that Currently making less money than his wife is a trigger to him because he verbalized it. He made himself aware of the emotion. He made his wife aware of the emotion. And now he's not going to be triggered and be a ticking time bomb during their conversations. Have you ever noticed that? That you have triggers that maybe you're not even aware of. And then you might be sitting at the dinner table. You might be at your job. You might be wherever you are. And then someone says something. They didn't want to hurt you. They didn't want to harm you, but they say something and it hit your trigger. Maybe you weren't aware. And when they hit it, you have a reaction that is so extra, that is so over the top. And everyone's looking at you like, what is going on? And you don't even know why you had that reaction. Do you know your triggers? Someone who is self-aware will be able to, uh, as a wife went to her husband and says, honey, I feel like I'm always competing for your attention with the kids. You're such a great father, but I don't feel like you give me the same attention as you do to the kids. This is a wife, this is a mom, a woman who is self-aware. And finally, another one, right? A daughter who went to her mother and said, mom, I feel like I will never amount. I feel like you have put me in such an impossible pedestal that I'm always reaching and never arriving. This is someone who shows that they are self-aware. They are open to explain and accurately explain what they are feeling inside. Okay. Humor is going to be a huge deal for people who are self-aware. They're going to be able to sort of laugh at themselves and they have what is interesting, a thirst for criticism. What does that mean? There's a Proverbs that I love in the Bible. It's Proverbs 26, six, and it says this wounds from a sincere friend are better than many kisses from an enemy. What does that mean? People who are self-aware because they are confident in their abilities. They know their weaknesses. They know their strength. And because they want to get better, they welcome critique. They welcome complaints because they know that this is the process of making them better, right? And so oftentimes these people will get together with a family or with a friend and ask them, Hey, what can I do to improve? What can I do to get better? And to me, this quality of self-confidence is because again, they know their strengths, they know their weaknesses, they play to their strengths, they find people to help them with their weaknesses, and they are, which to me is the sexiest quality in the world, they are teachable. Emotionally intelligent people are self-aware. And Moses in the Bible is a perfect example of someone who is self-aware. Moses. There's a story there in Exodus 18 and it says that Moses, he's just left Israel, right? Um, there he's roaming around the desert with all the Israelites and Jethro, his father-in-law comes to visit with his wife and Jethro sees all the commotion. He sees Moses dealing with all sorts of complaints. He sees Moses dealing with the smallest to medium to large matters. Now Moses, he just got out of Egypt. He was the guy who opened the Red Sea. He was a guy that God used to send all of these plagues to Egypt. But now his father-in-law Jethro gives him advice. He says, listen, Moses, you're going to burn yourself out. 
you're constantly having to deal with all of the issues and all of the problems of all these people. Why not find leaders to be able to help you manage the, this great people? Now, this is the amazing thing about Moses. Moses, he was an emotionally intelligent man who was very self-aware. And because he was self-confident, because he was teachable, look at what a writer says when speaking about the story. The Lord had greatly honored Moses and wrought wonders by his hand. But the fact that he had been chosen to instruct others did not lead him to conclude that he needed no instruction. The chosen leader of Israel listened gladly to the suggestions of his father-in-law, and then he adopted the plan. Why? Because Moses was teachable. He had a thirst for receiving any type of instruction, of counsel that would better him as a leader. So that's the first one. Emotionally intelligent people, they are self-aware. The second component that Dr. Goldman talks about is that emotionally intelligent people, they are able to self-regulate. And he calls that self-regulation. So I'm going to put it up here. Look. Self. Renee says, I'm putting it where you guys can't see it. Really? You can't? Well, we put that little marker there for what? Where? This one? Well, I'm not there. Y'all can see that, right? Self-regulation, okay? Here, next time I'll go here more. Okay, so the next one is self-regulation. What does that mean? I understand because as a human being, we have impulses, right? Biological impulses. Um, science will call it biological impulses. The Bible will call it temptations. Things that come to us without us welcoming it. Now, you've been here before, and so we know that, look, Behavior is the result of my environment plus my identity, or we can say character, right? Identity and character, we use these two words interchangeably. Now, my behavior is the result of my environment plus my identity or my character. Now, sometimes I choose an environment that I walk into temptation. So sometimes we seek temptation, we go after temptation, but other times temptation comes to us. Okay. So for example, Samson, you know, the guy from the Bible who he got in bed with Delilah and ultimately his secret that he had very long hair and this is the secret of his strength. She tricked him and the Philistines cut his hair and he lost all his strength, okay? Samson walked into that trap. Samson willingly and knowingly, even though God had told him, do not mingle with the Philistines, do not find for yourself a Philistine wife, but he wanted her, had to have her, and so he walked into an environment right? That ultimately changed his identity and character and the behavior, the result of his life was one that he regretted. But now, so look, these, these biological impulses, the temptation that Samson experienced was one that he himself caused. Now, look at, for, for example, someone like Joseph. Joseph, he did not choose that environment. Remember Joseph, the one who Potiphar's wife, she wanted him, desired him, had to have him, and she was constantly trying to get him to sleep with her. He did not walk into that environment, and so, but because he had a strong identity, a strong sense of character, even though his environment was producing temptation, he was able to manage it. Why? Because of self-regulation. Emotionally intelligent people have self-regulation and self-regulation does something. It frees us from being prisoners to our feelings. You and I, we do not have to be victims to our feelings. I always say it. Feelings, they might be real, but they are not necessarily true. The same thing with thoughts, right? Thoughts might be real, but they are not necessarily true. We're going to have to do a, an entire live just about concepts. There are principles that I use with my clients to teach them, to help them to guard their thoughts. And why do we need to guard our thoughts? Well, because look, here's another little, um, what do I say? We constantly are using this. Thoughts become actions. Actions become habits. Uh, what? what? 
No. And habits form your character, a.k.a. your identity. Right? Can you see that there? Yeah, it forms... I think I'm too far off. It forms your identity, right? And then it leads to the results of your life. And so look, thoughts lead to actions, actions to habits, habits to character. Now here's the thing. We need to get good at guarding our thoughts. And just because you have a thought does not make that thought re does not make that thought true. It's real, it's not true. And so those emotionally intelligent people are able to self-regulate, meaning they're able to challenge, they're able to manage, they're able to control and to channel their emotions. You and I, we need to learn to control and channel our bad moods and our emotional impulses or else we will always be a victim to chance. And when someone says, why did you do that? I don't know. I felt like it. And then we're just going to be a bunch of robots being led by our feelings and not by our principles and our values. Okay. And so how do we control and channel this? So look, today we are sort of lining everything up where you and I can understand what is emotional intelligence and then I'm going to have you join us next week because I'm going to give you specific things, specific ways in how we can develop whichever one you seem to be missing, okay? Why does it matter? Why does self-regulation matter? Well, it matters because those who are able to control their feelings and impulses, they create an environment of trust and fairness. Of course. Of course you're going to create an environment of trust and fairness if you can control and regulate your emotions. And then when you are able to regulate your emotions, it causes a trickling effect. Think about it. Think about it if you are a business owner, if you are a father, if you are a mother, whatever. Being able to self-regulate, you're going to minimize relational regret because you are going to not be acting on your emotions, but you're going to be acting on principles. First, I need to become self-aware. I need to be aware of the emotions and the feelings that I am feeling, and then that is not enough. I need to go one step further. Now I need to understand how can I control it, and then how can I channel it to use it not against me, but for me. Okay, so it's going to have a trickling effect in your family and in your organization. Why? Because of a little thing called mirror neurons. You know the old saying um, that parents sometimes say to their kids, right? Don't do as I do as I say, not as I do. Well, that doesn't work because God has given us something called mirror neurons. So people are going to imitate your actions, not your words, which is why it is so incredibly important that you and I know how to control and channel self regulate our emotions, okay? And then, and this is one that I'm very interesting or interested about. Let me erase this so we have more room. Okay, which is this idea that self-regulation enhances integrity. Well, what does that mean and how does that work? Well, think about it. S integrity is not only a personal virtue, right? It's something that we all want to have, but integrity is something that you want any type of um, coworker to have. If you are a business owner, obviously you're gonna want to hire and people with integrity, right? And here's why. Rarely do bad things happen in companies or in relationships or in societies and communities because bad things happen as a function of impulse, impulsive behavior, right? Where you're put in a situation and in that moment you have to make a decision. People who are able to self-regulate have this idea that they're able to delay gratification. If I can delay gratification, I can lower impulsive behavior. That's why emotionally intelligent people raise integrity in wherever they go because they're able to regulate their emotions, they're able to lessen impulsive behavior, and they are high in the concept of delayed gratification. People rarely plan to, you know, you don't go to work on a Monday and you plan to exaggerate profits. You don't show up on a Wednesday and you're trying to abuse selfish gain, right? You're trying to abuse power for selfish gain. It's typically impulsive behavior. Think about the bad decisions that you have made in your life and I have made a ton in my life, and it's usually out of impulse. However, if you and I can self-regulate, if we can do a better job at managing our impulses, we will lessen what? Of course, you're going to minimize relational regret. So now look, um, maybe you've heard of this before. It's called the marshmallow test. Have you heard of it before? So what is the marshmallow test? 
So what happens is in the 1960s, a group of researchers, they got together, they wanted to explain this concept of delay gratification, right? And of course, whenever you and I are trying to accomplish anything, a goal that we have in our lives, we need to be really good at delaying gratification. Think about it. For in order for you to, you know, my my brother went, oh my god, he studied it seems like forever because he wanted to become a doctor. He had to delay gratification. So many times that I see my brother opt out from going out with friends because he had to stay home to study. Because why? He had a goal. He was in pursuit of a goal. And because of that goal, he needed to be able to say no to what he wanted right now so that he could say yes to what he wanted in, his, in the future, which was to become a doctor. And so what do they do? Um, this famous experiment, you can go online and you can you can check it out if you go on, on YouTube. It's really funny. And over the years, people have um, redone it. I actually did it a couple of weeks ago with River and Reed. Um, I'll share it on my on my stories here and you can watch it if you want. Uh, and so the concept, the idea, is that these researchers put kids um, in a room and they offer them a marshmallow, right? And the researchers said this, listen, you can choose to eat the marshmallow right now, or if you wait, when I come back, I'm going to give you another marshmallow. So instead of one, you are now going to have two. And so they left the room and they told them not to eat and they were watching them through mirrors to see. Now, so many amazing things happen. Maybe one day we'll do a live just on the marshmallow experience so that it teaches us specific ways that these, what these specific kids did to delay gratification. So it's really interesting. But anyways, the point for tonight is that you and I, this idea of delayed gratification, look at this. The study followed the children into their adolescence and the kids who had delayed gratification and resisted their impulses to eat their marshmallows first were, now I want you to take note and write this down if you have paper and pen, take note at all of the positive consequences that resulted in the kids who were able to delay gratification. The ones who said, I will not eat this marshmallow, I'm going to wait for my second marshmallow. These kids were able to self-regulate their emotion. Their emotion and their feelings said, eat that marshmallow, it's yummy, it's gooey, it's delicious. But because they were able to self-regulate, say no, delay gratification, look at the results when these researchers accompany them. They were effective, assertive, confident, self-reliant, socially competent, trustworthy, dependable, cool under pressure, embracing of challenges, and still capable of delaying immediate gratification in pursuit of a goal. They were able to self-regulate. They were more emotionally intelligent. They were, look at this, they are more successfully academically with higher SAT scores. If you are able to self-regulate, if you are able to delay gratification, you are going to decrease impulsive behavior, and of course, you are going to minimize relational regret. On the other side, the kids who ate the first marshmallow, who did not wait for the second marshmallow, look at this. They were shy in social situations, jealous, envious, combative, stubborn, indecisive, and easily frustrated. Self-critical, look at this. Self-critical, right? The self-awareness was not there. They're self-critical, prone to overreacting, no impulse control, still incapable of delaying gratification, and it even affected academically, less successful academically with lower SAT scores by 210 points. That's insane, okay? So this is why emotional intelligence matter. This is why all of these five areas that I'm gonna show you and demonstrate you matter. It not only matters in the triangle of life, remember we saw that, the triangle of life, relationships, health and vocation, it's affecting all of your relationships, but without emotional intelligence, you will not be able to dominate the triangle of death, stress, fear, and anxiety. Okay, what's the next one? Renee's gonna kill me if I put it on this side, even though I'm really tempted to, can I? Right here? No. He says no. Okay, so what am I gonna do? I'll put it here. Here? Okay. The next one is motivation, but I want you to think about it like this, like one, two, three, okay? These first three are about your emotional intelligence with yourself because, well, you and I first need to be emotionally intelligent with us. I need to under, I need to know, I need to manage, right? And I need to put it into application in my life first so that way I can 
you know, understand, manage, and help and influence the emotions of others. What does this idea of motivation mean? Those who are emotionally intelligent are able to motivate themselves. And they have this um, drive to go above and beyond expectations, not only their own, but themselves. Of course, if I'm someone who is self-motivated, if I'm always trying to go above and beyond, I'm going to make a great lover. I'm going to make a great worker. I'm going to make a great parent. Why? Because I'm not trying to do the bare minimum. I'm trying to do one step more. I'm trying to do better all the time. Now, those who are emotionally intelligent, they are motivated. And this is what I love. They're not motivated by external factors such as, you know, more salary. They're not motivated by, well, if I do this, I'm going to get caught, right? They are motivated by internal. They just have an internal drive. Why? Based on their principles and their values. And this is why it matters. External factors will always change, right? Your job, your, um, your job might be a jerk. Your, no, not your job, your, boss. your boss, golly, your boss might be a jerk, right? So if you're only going to perform in your job based on what your boss might say or not say to you, you're going to be based on external factors. You're going to be very low motivated. But if what motivates me is me internal, not external, remember last week, an external locus of control versus an internal locus of control, emotionally resilient people, now look at the word, emotionally intelligent people are motivated internally, just as emotionally resilient people have an internal locus of control. They are motivated by this deep embedded beliefs in their principles and their values. And so, I don't know, you can take an example of someone like Moses, right? We, we were just talking about him. We'll take his example again. Moses, he was motivated because he had a, such a sense of purpose. He knew exactly what God wanted him to do. Even when the Israelites, external forces, okay? The Israelites were so pissed off and ticked off at Moses that several times they wanted to stone the guy. They wanted to kill the guy. But Moses was not moved or motivated by whether or not the Israelites liked him or didn't like him. He was motivated internally. And oftentimes Moses was praying for the very people who wanted to stone him. It's absolutely incredible. Joseph, the other person we just talked about, Joseph, his brothers were jerks. They sold him into slavery, external forces. However, internal forces, he chose to remain with integrity and even forgive his brothers when he had the chance to pay them back. He didn't. Why? Because he was motivated, deeply embedded by this desire for Moses and for Joseph, which was that they were going to honor God. What motivates you? If it's external forces, we are in trouble. Emotionally intelligent people have an internal source of motivation. How do we know? What are the signs? Well, if I were you, I would start to figure out I, I am statements. What is your identity? Remember, I'm going to do it again. Look, thoughts become actions. Actions become habits. Habits form your character. A K A your identity. Am I still on the page, Renee? And ultimately, this will determine your destiny. AKA the results of your life. Good. Yeah, I think you can see it. So look, this here, character, AKA your identity, you choose who you want to become, right? You choose your character. Character is not accident. It's not IQ. It's not any of this. Character is choice. You choose. And so why do I am statements matter? Well, because I am statements become something internal that because you have chosen that, you are going to then produce results, make actions based on who you chose to be, right? Kind of like this. Oh, I, I erased it. Okay. So look, think about it like this. What are, what are the ones for you? Let's say that one of your I am statements is I am a Christian. Okay. If that is a statement, if that is a declaration, if that is internally who you believe to be, then you are going to act like a Christian, even when external forces pulls you to act in a different way. Let me give you an example. There's an interesting little story that I read in a book. It's called, um, daring to live by every word or daring something like that. 
It's by Melody, uh, Melody Mason. It's a great little book. And in it, she shares a story about a man who he was harboring Jews during the war, right? And he was found out, and he, he was hiding a bunch of them, and he was found out by a man called the Destroyer. And so this man goes to him, and he goes, do you know what I could do to you? I am the destroyer, and I'm going to kill your family and your kids, and I'm going to kill you if you do not retract. And basically say like, hey, you know, I shouldn't have done that, and let us kill the Jews. And he would not. And so and what happens? First, the destroyer goes up to him. He kills his wife. The man is watching. He goes, he's like, listen, you better retract. You better tell us where the Jews are, or I'm going to cut... He didn't say anything, and then he goes after the man's kids. And then finally, he's now looking face to face to this guy. And he goes, do you know what I could do to you? I can kill you, I could destroy you. And the man looks at him and goes, I know, I know you can do all these things, but you can't make me hate you. So look at this. This man took an identity of I am a Christian and external forces, his environment, this man was not able to take away the motivating factor of his life, the thing that ruled his life, Emotionally intelligent, his motivation was, I am a Christian. And externally, it showed. Does that make sense? So what are the signs of people who are motivated, emotionally intelligently motivated? They have a passion for the progress, not just the end results. They take pride in doing things well done. They have an unfaltering energy. They are persistent in knowing the why of things. And that's why they make great employees. That's why they minimize relational regret. If you are constantly seeking for better ways to better love your wife, to better love your husband, to better play with your kids, of course, if you're motivated internally by this, you minimize relational regret. They are forever raising the performance bar. They are keeping score, not keeping tallies like, hey, I did this and so now you have to pay me back. They're keeping scores because they're trying to maximize how they can become better. They remain optimistic and they are consistently and forever committed to the triangle of life, right? Which is health, relationship, and vocation. All right, here's the next one. We got two more to get to, and then we are going to land this plane. Emotionally intelligent people, the first three have to do with you. They are self-aware. Self-aware what? They know their strengths. They know their weaknesses. They understand their emotions, and then they're able to self-regulate your emotions. It doesn't matter if you know, I'm angry right now. I'm pissed off right now. I'm stressed right now. If you can't then self-regulate, if you cannot dominate stress, fear, and anxiety, just knowing that you're fearful, just knowing that you're stressed, just knowing that you're anxious is not enough. We need to be able to self-regulate. We need to be able to control and then we need to be able to channel that energy, right? And then finally, we need to be able to motivate ourselves, not by external factors, because that'll change. If you're only gonna be motivated if you're getting X amount of money, well, that's that sucks, right? Because until you get to that amount, you're gonna be doing pretty mediocre work. If you're doing pretty mediocre work, you're not gonna get hired to do anything more. And the Bible is so huge on motivation because the Bible says this, do all things, for man as if you're doing for God. God is in the business of little things. Little things make a big difference. So if we are not being faithful with the little things, clearly we are not going to be faithful with much. There's actually a little parable that talks about this. In this parable, um, the, the farmer, the gardener, he goes there and he gives all these men different amount of money, right? $1 here, $10 there, and whatever, $100 there. I'm probably getting the numbers incorrectly. But the point of the message is this. When the farmer comes back and he says, hey, what did you do with the one? What did you do with the 10? What did you do with the 100? The 10 multiplied, the 100 multiplied, and the one kept it to himself because he was scared of, well, if you came back and I didn't multiply it, I was scared and so I buried it. And what happened? Because he was not faithful to multiply the one, the one who made the most money, he says, well, give me that one, and he gave it to the one who made 100. What is God trying to say in this little parable? Well, you and I, God is in the business of multiplying. So if God has given you one talent, let's say you have the talent of singing. Well, you need to multiply that talent. Maybe now you have the talent, because you have the talent of singing, 
and you did that really, really well, then God opened the doors for now you have the talent of playing an instrument. And because you now have the talent of singing and the talent of playing an instrument, maybe you started a band and now you have the talent of, of leading the band. Does that make sense? So with whatever gift that God has given you, whatever talent God has given you, you start to do really well on that one thing and God will begin to multiply, okay? And now we're on the next one. Number four, again, these three have to do with you. Now these next two have to do with how you relate to other people. Remember, if you're just joining us now, we are talking emotional intelligence and how emotional intelligence minimizes relational regret. Here's four. Four is empathy. Okay, number four is empathy. Empathy is this. It doesn't mean that now we are going to take on everyone's emotions, make it our own, and that we're just gonna go around and we're going to forever please people and we don't care about ourselves. It's not, empathy does not mean that you are a doormat, okay? That does not, that is not what empathy means. Empathy means that we thoughtfully consider another's emotion. That we're sympathetic says, oh man, I see you, in a bad situation, that sucks. Empathy goes there, puts their shoes on, and tries to understand the situation. Thoughtfully consider another's feelings. And in the process of what? I am self-aware, I can self-regulate, and because I'm aware and I can regulate my emotions, I can now observe, understand, and help you with yours, right? And make decisions not only based on my emotions, but now make decisions based on your emotions. Empathy and justification are two completely different things. You can be empathetic towards someone, even though you're not necessarily justifying their bad behavior or their bad choices. In fact, there's a story in the Bible um, where Abraham, remember he's married to Sarah, and even though God promises Abraham and Sarah that they're going to have a child, Sarah does not believe. She's thinking, man, I'm so old. This promise was so long ago, so she tries to do things her way. So what happens? She comes up with a brilliant idea, <laughs> awful idea, that Abraham should sleep with her slave, Agar. Now, Abraham, sleeps with Agar, has a child with Agar, and now all hell breaks loose because Sarah is jealous. Look at this, self-aware, right? She was jealous, she was angry, she was feeling like the other. She had a horrible, she did a horrible job at regulating her emotion. She did a horrible job at motivation, and she did a horrible job with empathy. So she gets all mad, and she wants Abraham to send, she wants Abraham to send this woman away, send this woman away. Well, Abraham is like, well, now she has my son, right? She was pregnant with Ishmael. Well, look at how God comes and intervenes. God shows empathy, but he does not justify that situation. That should have never happened. Ultimately, God says, Agar needs to go because she was coming in between the familiar relationship. She was right. She was increasing relational regret. And so although Agar was sent away, it never should have happened. It was Sarah's fault. They disobeyed God's command to only have one man and one wife. Well, Agar is sent away, but as she's on the journey, there is empathy on God's part, and he sends an angel, and the angel takes care of Agar through her journey, feeds them, clothes them, all that. So that's the difference between empathy and justification, okay? Why does it matter? Empathy is going to be our antidote to understand the miscues and the misunderstanding. Emotionally intelligent people are able to use empathy in their favor. Why? Leaders, people, employees, husbands, wives who have empathy as a tool in their tool belt are able to, even though someone might be saying something with their mouth, their body language might be showing something completely different. So we need to be aware of not only what is being said, but what, how what is being said is being communicated, right? And so what I always say, what you say is important, but how you say it is even more important. Emotionally intelligent people use empathy as a tool to see beyond the words that are being spoken, and they start to see the subtlety of body language, of tone, of facial expressions. They hear the message behind and beneath the words that are, spro that are spoken, okay? And because of that, 
Look, in fact, there was um, a CEO that had hired me um, to work with one of his coworkers. And the reason why, he was an emotionally intelligent man and he understood this concept of empathy and not justification. So he had someone who was working for him and she was not able to self-regulate her emotions, okay? So all of her personal life she was bringing into her work life and it was causing a ruckus, it was causing a mess. And so this um, empathetic leader, he had two options. He could either fire her or he could not justify her bringing the personal into professional, but he wanted to work with her. Empathetic people are able to help their people to help their families, to help their community become better, change. And so he calls me so that I can work with her. And by working with her, he was he wanted to understand her viewpoints. He wanted to understand her weaknesses. He wanted to understand her strengths. And he said this, it's so much easier for me. It's so much better for me and for my company that we would work with her instead of getting rid of her and hiring another. And that's exactly what happens. Leaders who are able to empathize, they use their knowledge to improve the company in subtle ways. It would have cost him so much more if he would have simply fired her. But because he showed empathy towards her situation and then found help for her situation, not only was she able to heal, not only were we able to work together and she was finally able to self-regulate, right? I taught her how to self-regulate, but guess what? She remained now a forever loyal employee to the CEO. I mean, he got, he had it both ways. She got the help she needed. Because of his empathy, she, he had now a great worker, but he also had a loyal worker. That's why empathy matters. And finally, here's the last one, and then we are going to land this plane. Number five, social skills. Now look, I know this is a lot of information, um, maybe because I speak about this all the time and I try to talk about this over and over and over again. To me, it clicks, right? We can talk about the five all day long. So what do I want you to do? It's going to stay right here on the IGTV. So watch it again. Remember, the first three talk about you, emotionally intelligent people. They are self-aware. They are able to regulate their emotions. They are motivated internally, not externally. They are able to empathize with other people. When we are aware and know our weaknesses and our strengths, we can also then lend that favor to others and help people understand their emotions and help them regulate their emotions. Empathy does not mean justification. It does not mean that now we are going to be doormats to everyone everyone's emotions and everyone's awful self regulation no, 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 no. It just means that we are going to be able to see body language, to hear tone, and to help people better express themselves, okay? And finally, social skills. Now, I love social skills because it's almost like accumulation of the four, okay? If I'm self-aware, if I can self-regulate, if I'm motivated and I have empathy, it comes together with social skill. The reason why this matters is because research is showing that what is mattering more than, than IQ, right? What is mattering more than IQ is emotional intelligence, two times more. Uh, this ability to be able to talk to people and understand people and have a conversation and explain myself is a necessary tool in any and every relationship in your life. And of course, it minimizes relational regret. So. It's not, people who have social skill, they're not just, they have friendliness, but their friendliness is with a purpose. Why? Because they have this desire to move people in a direction, not to manipulate people, but because they like people. They wanna be around people and they have a, a goal for these people, right? They have a wide circle of acquaintances. They have this gift, this knack for finding common ground with all types of people. They have a, an ability to just build rapport. Oh, Jesus was the best person at doing this, right? He could find common ground with different people. He was sitting with the tax collectors. He was sitting with the prostitutes. He was having lunch with the fishermen. He, Jesus, was huge on social skills, right? He was able to quickly build rapport. Now, those who are good at social skills, they're not, you know, if, if you have an employee who is emotionally intelligent and displays social skills, sometimes you'll see him socializing and you're thinking, man, he's not getting anything done, right? He's lazy or he's irresponsible. But those who are 
socializing, they're doing it for the point of network because they understand this. One is a number too small to achieve any type of greatness. We need people, we are not an island. So emotionally intelligent people understand an African proverb that is my favorite proverb that says this, if you wanna go fast, go alone. If you wanna go far, go together. Emotionally intelligent people understand that they need other people. Uh, a John Maxwell quote that I love, he says this, inheritance is what we leave for people, legacy is what we leave in people. People who have social skills, who are emotionally intelligent, they understand that they're building a legacy. They want to motivate people. They want to network with people because they understand that there will be a time when everyone will be necessary. The emotionally intelligent person does not overlook the janitor. The emotionally intelligent person does not overlook the son or the maid or the person serving in the restaurant. Why? Because they know that everyone serves a purpose and that we need people. So social skills is the accumulation. If you see someone who has good social skills, who's not overlooking people, you know that they are self-aware, self-regulating, motivated, and empathizing. Okay, and where does this show? Those who have social skills, where am I seeing it? They're great managers. They're great leaders. They're, they're great patriarchs in the family. They're expert persuaders. Again, they're not persuading because they're trying to get people to do all the things that they want to do for them. No, 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 they're excellent persuaders because they build rapport, they build relationship with people. They're excellent collaborators, they understand teamwork. Wouldn't you want to be around someone who has social skills, someone who can collaborate, someone who understands the importance of teamwork and Again, they build bonds widely. They understand that we get work through people, right? We get work through people. And so they're all about people. Social skill allows leaders to put their emotional work in their emotional intelligence into work. So now for those who are here, thank you, thank you. We're about to land this plane. Here it is, if you missed it, emotional intelligence. We talked about five components, the first three talking about you and the second two talking about how you relate to other people. And so hopefully emotional intelligence will, as you apply this, minimize your relational regrets. Join us next week as we start to fine tune, and I wanna give you specific ways how you are going to be able to develop this ideal of emotional intelligence. All right, see you next time.